going to present some work we've done recently with my collaborators, uh, Pierre Fleury, Jean-Philippe Uzan, Nathalie Hogg, and Matteo Martinelli about measuring uh, a new methods that we are proposing to measure cosmic shear using strong lensing events. So this is uh, essentially an idea of using uh, strong lensing images like Einstein rings as standard shapes to do some cosmology. Right. Um, the, the idea of using uh, strong lensing to probe uh, the distributions of dark matter structures uh, is not new. It's been used for about uh, over a decade now to try and detect directly small subhalos uh, in the main strong lensing lens or along the line of sight, which I represent here respectively in red and in yellow, to uh, uh, by uh, trying to uh, fit the effect they might have on strong lensing images. Um, so this is a, a promising route to constrain dark matter on small scales, which can have important implications for dark matter models. Um, However, what uh, we are interested in here are collective effects of line of sight halos, which themselves perturb the strong lensing events, um, and that are usually treated as noise in strong lensing. This is the case, for example, in the time delay cosmography to determine H naught, for example, by the collaboration TD Cosmo at the moment. However, um, this noise can be seen as a new window uh, to probing cosmic shear, so the effect of large-scale structure now. Uh, this was first pointed by Simon Birach a few years ago, and this is what we are trying to pursue here. Um, so I've put here on the right an image of what a, a, a strong lensing event, a perfect Einstein ring, would look like in presence of a distribution of halos here represented by these blue circles along the line of sight. And you can clearly see that a perfectly uh, symmetrical ring would be deformed in a very complex way by the presence of these halos. So this is what we are trying to uh, measure here. All right, so just a quick reminder of strong lensing in a Friedman context. So I'm not going to get into the details of the equations, but simply to mention that what we usually call strong lensing is the distortion caused on light beams from a source to an observer that lead to a multiple images of the same source via a, a lens equation, which I write here, connecting beta, which is the position on the sky the source would have in absence, oh, sorry, in absence of the lens, and theta, which is the apparent positions this source has on the sky, and this can be uh, multiply valued. All right, this can be generalized to the presence of several lenses along the line of sight, but we are interested in the case where one of those lenses is strong, so here represented in blue, leading to several images uh, of the same source, and the other population of lenses is weak. Weak meaning that it doesn't uh, it doesn't lead to uh, multiple images of the same source, but simply to small distortions to the beam generated by the strong lensing event here. So this leads to a lens equation, which is formally exactly the same as in standard strong lensing, but with more complication here added by the coupling between the lensing events, all right? Um, if we analyze what happens, we have three types of displacement. So of course, first we have here the main displacement caused by the strong lens in absence of everything else. Then we have the uh, displacement caused by the foregrounds, which essentially amounts to uh, uh, summing the individual displacement due to the, the lenses in the foreground. We have a background displacement, which is a bit more complicated because it couples the weak 
distortions due to the weak lens with the effect of the strong lens. And we have a non-trivial effect, which comes from the fact that the physical light ray here in orange intersects the main the plane of the main lens in a different point than it would in absence of the weak lenses. And so this is represented by this term here in the displacement of the main lens. All right. Uh, this dominant lens approximation, which we developed to treat the weak lensing of strong lensing event, um, is already fairly complex, but we can make further assumptions, um, which is uh, which takes the form of a tidal approximation, and this is the first step in uh, trying to use these strong lensing images as standard shape. So what is this tidal regime? Well, it amounts to assuming that each little perturba here represented in orange again, um, leads to a deformation of the strong lensed beam that are constant across the field of view. So this is usually the case if the halos leading to the deformation are far from the line of sight or are very diffuse. Okay, if you do that, then all the effects are encapsulated in magnification effect, which are called convergence in lensing, and here shearing effects that are uh, encapsulated in these gammas here. So this is the approximation we are going to do in the rest of this talk. And if we do that in the context of one strong lensing event like this, we see that a perfectly symmetrical Einstein ring would be deformed into a ellipse like this. All right, and this is parameterized essentially by nine three parameters, three convergences here, a convergence for the foreground contribution, kappa OD, a convergence for the background, and an overall convergence, and similarly, three shear, a foreground shear, a background shear, and an overall shear, which are complex numbers, hence the, the nine free parameters here. In that case, the displacement field that enters the uh, lens equation takes this very simple form. And so you see we have three matrices encapsulating all the effects in the tidal regime. The I will not talk about convergence here. This is because it is a well-known fact that uh, convergence effects in strong lensing are degenerate with the mass, the overall mass of the main lens. This is known as the mass sheet degeneracy. And so they are not measurable quantities. However, what I want to, to demonstrate is that certain combinations of the shear caused by large scale structures or halos distributed along the line of sight are measurable. All right. So what we did in uh, our paper last year, oh, well, actually, no, it's not last year, it's two years ago now, um, is to reanalyze this model with nine parameters and show that there were some degeneracies in the model. So essentially, uh, we have no access to the profile of the source, which is represented here by this uh, complex number of vector beta. So we can always reparameterize the profile of the source without changing any of the physics of our problem. So that's a sort of an internal freedom to the source. And if we use that internal freedom to the source, we can show that uh, there is an equivalent lens model, which take a very simple form and brings the system down to six parameters. Uh, essentially, what we do is we reabsorb the foreground, the, yes, sorry, the foreground effects here, gamma OD, into the lens model. So in principle, there's a total degeneracy between the ellipticity of the main strong lens and the foreground shear. And we replace all the shearing effect along the line of sight by one external tide applied in the main lens. So note that uh, that external tide effect is what has been applied in the literature for years. But what was not clear is how, how the foreground, background uh, um, perturbers contributed to that tide. And that now is absolutely clear. And it's this specific linear combinations that must enter the lens model. 
So this is what I call the minimal lens model because we've reduced here the, the number of free parameters as much as was possible. So if we look a little bit at the shear coming in this, so what we call the line of sight shear, which is this a shear external tide appearing in the minimal lens model, um, I plotted here the relative contribution to that um, shear of various perturbers along the line of sight. So here I represent a main uh, so a source at a say a a, a given co-moving distance chi s here, a, a main lens situated here at about 60% of the of the uh, co-moving distance. And here you can see the relative contribution of each perturber. And you can see that it peaks in the foreground here. So it has a different kernel compared to the standard weak lensing shear. So that might be important in the future. All right. So I want to be, I mean, in our path to, to discussing the measurability of this cosmic line of sight shear, the first thing was to demonstrate the advantage of using our minimal model over the total um, fully parameterized lens model with foreground, background, and overall shear. So to that end, what we did was simulate a very simple image using elliptical power law for the lens light, uh, for the overall lens, actually, adding some light, uh, lens light, adding some, some uh, HST type noise, and using a very simple CERSIC profile for the source. And we obtained a, a beautiful image of an Einstein ring like this. Um, we added to that some foreground, background, and overall shear, gamma OD, gamma DS, and gamma OS, generating that specific image. Then we tried to fit that image uh, with an MCMC, standard MCMC procedure, uh, while retaining the full parameterization of the line of sight. So using gamma OD, gamma DS, and gamma OS. And what we find is here in that corner plot here, and you can see that if you look at gamma OD, um, we have strong degeneracies between, uh, sorry, where would that be? Yeah, um, we have strong degeneracies between gamma OD and the lens ellipticity. So this is very difficult to disentangle them as we expected. So there is no way of measuring the background, the foreground shear uh, on the other hand, we have a very accurate um, reconstruction of our line of sight shear here, but not very precise with errors of several percent on this extremely, extremely simple image. On the other hand, if we use the minimal lens uh, uh, model now with the external tide, uh, we see that the degeneracies uh, with gamma OD persist, so I haven't represented it here. And we have very accurate and very precise reconstructions of the line of sight shear components with errors in this very ideal case that are very, very, very small, 10 to the minus four here. So we're very confident that uh, it is the minimal uh, line of sight model that we need to use if we want to measure shear. And so as uh, just to remind you that that means that what we are able to measure is that particular combination of the effect of individual perturbers, halo perturbers along the line of sight. All right. The next step, of course, is to try and validate this method on a uh, reasonably realistic mock catalog of images. So to achieve that, we've generated a, a large, I mean, a, a certain number of uh, mock strong lensing images using a fairly uh, complicated uh, composite model for the main lens. So what we've done is we've constructed the main lens as a, a cold dark matter elliptic uh, NFW halo here, represented in purple. We've added to that some... Uh, Bions and in the form of an Cersic uh, profile with an ellipticity that is not aligned with the, the one of the dark matter halo and a center that is not aligned with the dark matter halo center either. So we've allowed for offsets between the two, which uh, is present in some simulations. 
And we've uh, used a certain parameterization of the source in a CERSIC form as well. So doing that, we've generated a large number of images of Einstein rings, of partial Einstein rings that I show you here. We've selected here seven, uh, six to four of them that we called our golden sample using some, uh, some quality factor, uh, taking into account the, the weighted sum of, of signal to noise in each pixels of the image here. So you can clearly see the Einstein ring. You can see the, the light, the lens light here. And the level of noise we've used is typical of um, HST type images. All right. Uh, then we fitted a certain number of models to these images. And to check the importance of the full parameterization here or the complexity of the main lens and our ability to reconstruct the line of sight shear, we've uh, fitted a certain number of, of models, removing some of the complexity and seeing how it degrades our ability to fit the image. So here is an example of one of these, uh, oh, my, oops, I'm sorry. I don't know why my, my pointer disappeared. Let me get it yes. back in. Oh, you could see, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't see it anymore. Here it is. So here's an example of one of the 64 images, not necessarily the best one, as you can see. We only have a, if uh, I mean, a large, but, but not the total fraction of the Einstein ring available. And this is a lot of lens light. And you can see that, oops, sorry, uh, if you look at the what I call the comprehensive model, so that means taking into account a model for the lens light as complicated as the one that was used to simulate the image, this is represented in round here, we have a, very, a precise and fairly accurate determination of our line of sight uh, shear components of order a few percent uh, in terms of precision. If we remove the foreground shear from this parameterization, uh, you can see that we don't degrade much our precision and we don't bias much our result. This is in line with the fact that the foreground shear is, is um, uh, degenerate with the, uh, the, with the, sorry, uh, main lens ellipticity. So it's not really a needy parameter. So we can ignore the foreground shear in our fit. However, as soon as we start removing, for example, the misalignment, the possible misalignment between the Bayan and the CDM components of our main lens, so forcing the center of the two components to align while still leaves, uh, leaving their ellipticities free, then we see that we completely bias our, our results. So this seemed to be an important parameter to keep in mind when fitting uh, this sort of observable. And here to illustrate uh, the importance of a complexity uh, in the main lens, you can see that if we fit a simple power law to the uh, main lens profile, like is uh, done very often, then we completely bias our results. All right. Uh, so if we apply the same technique to the entire sample, you can see here the output gamma line of sight uh, versus the input gamma line of sight. So remember that uh, the input for us is not the gamma line of sight, it's the individual foreground, background, and total uh, line of sight shear, but then we reconstruct the line of sight shear from that in the input, and then our MCMC outputs the, the gamma line of sight. Then you can see that if we take our comprehensive fitting model, we have a very nice regular reconstruction of the components of the shear across the different values of the shear, uh, fairly large, a few percent shear here, whereas this degrades rapidly if the complexity of our lens uh, is not taken into account. So the message here is that, yes, we can reconstruct uh, the line of sight shear from uh, Einstein rings, but we have to be careful to um, include sufficient complexity in the simulate in the, sorry, in the model fitting our lens in conjunction with the line of sight shear. 
Finally, uh, in the last part, it is reasonable to wonder if the tidal approximation that we've used to extract the shear here is valid in, let's say, a, a, a realistic universe. So to try and understand that, we've simulated a distribution of dark matter halos along the line of sight. So we've taken here a source at about four, I mean, about, uh, yeah, uh, four and a half gigaparsec from us. We are situating here, um, and each dot in that plot here is a dark matter halo. We've simulated that with a, a standard halo mass function with cuts between 10 to the 8 solar masses and 10 to the 15 solar masses. Uh, we haven't used halo clustering here, which is important and will need to be included in the future to have a full assessment of the situation, but we expect they... Uh, I mean, by, by some uh, semi-analytical argument, let's say we expect the result to be better if, if clustering is taken into account. So each of these halos creates some shear on the uh, Einstein uh, on the Einstein ring generated by the strong lensing event uh, that we simulated here. I've represented the shear, the count of uh, the value of the shear here. Um, for each of the halos. So you see that a, a large majority of halos are really producing small shear, but occasionally we have shear of a few percent. So remember here that our ability to, to, to fit data for shears up to a few percent um, is uh, satisfied in, in, in this simulation. To In order to probe if individual halos were in the tidal approximation, we've looked at the gradient of the shear they produced along the line of sight um, across the image. And if these gradients are small, we can assume that they are producing fairly homogeneous shear on the, on the image um, plane. And so they are in the tidal regime. Um, you can see that some of these halos seem to evade the tidal approximation quite significantly. It's few in the sample. They are represented here in red. And as expected, these are the halos that are situated exactly or very close to the line of sight. So which produce, uh, yeah, non-homogeneous distortions on the field of view. You have five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I thank you. I think I'm, I'm uh, right on time. Thank you. Uh, so we generated an image this time, very simple, no nothing uh, in the complexity here because of the main lens, because that was not what we were trying to assess. Uh, and you can see the image, you can see the reconstructed uh, um, Einstein ring here and the residuals here. So we see fairly strong residuals that are due to this red uh, halos here. If we remove the red halos, these residuals completely go off. I mean, almost go off. So it's really these halos evading the tidal approximation that generate these residuals. However, it has to be noted that although we have, we seem to have a significant non-tidal signal in our images, we can still reconstruct fairly accurately and precisely the line of sight shear, which is presented here, despite these residuals. So uh, this is a good sign. Um, uh, this is a yeah, this is a good sign for the method. However, I should mention that with my PhD student, Theo Dubosc, we are now busy trying to model these residuals along the line of sight because they contain some. Uh, information on the very small halos, so the very uh, concentrated, small-scale dark matter distribution. All right, so this uh, leads me to my conclusion. I hope I've shown you that uh, the line of sight shear that with uh, design can be accurately and precisely measured at least on, re on a sample of reasonable images simulated uh, with um, what we would expect in uh, images coming from HST, but also from Euclid, for example. Um, we have uh, our halos along the line of sight that can break the tidal approximation, and they induce uh, effects that do not spoil shear measurements, but are potentially measurable. Uh, 
we are currently uh, working on applying these methods to actual images, but this takes some time. Uh, we are trying to validate everything carefully, in particular by having some ray tracing in numerical simulations to really evaluate the, the effect of these tidal breaking halos. Um, we are busy uh, introducing uh, beyond tidal effects on the minimal model. So this is what I call the minimal model with flexion. And finally, uh, we are now uh, also trying to see what can be gained by using this line of sight shear in conjunction with a more uh, conventional way of measuring uh, weak lensing. So via weak lensing surveys, but also cross correlating it with galaxy survey, galaxy, galaxy lensing, etc. I should mention that uh, as you've seen, we can reconstruct gamma LOS for individual lenses, but we expect the real power of all this to be in the statistics using future surveys such as Euclid and LSST. Um, the, the current expectations are that a, a Euclid will see up to uh, 10 to the five Einstein rings. So even if or not all these rings are um, exploitable for line of sight shear, we expect to be left with a fairly large sample and to be able to do statistics on, on that new observable. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julian. It was a very interesting work that you are carrying out, I think, uh, with lots of application. Uh, do we have questions? If not, I will have a quick question. So uh, I did not hear anything about magnification factor in these uh, lens models. So I was just wondering uh, uh, how does the change in the magnification factor impacts those uh, simulation uh, that you are showing the different types of uh, Yes, so the the, the magnificate oh yes right so um we are planning to to look at uh quads so uh, of uh lens quasars in particular and look at the uh, flux ratio the impact that this line of side effects can have on flux ratios for example this is in the pipeline as well absolutely for now we've only looked at standard shapes so einstein rings but it is true that uh we expect these uh these shearing effects to have some impact on flux ratios uh, we more importantly, uh, we expect flexion, so beyond shear, to have significant impacts. So this is something we want to look at in the future. All right. Thank you. Long live India and France friendship.